I'm very excited to share our work about the usability and archival stability, especially in the settings of academia. So uh, probably you have spent uh, many years in the desert if you didn't hear how the computational uh, research and computational tools are shaping the landscape of modern uh, biology, where the availability of the high throughput technology makes that possible to infer computational and solve many uh, problems. And the bioinformatics tools is the frontier between the increasing amount of the data and then the meaningful interpretation of the data. And uh, that's great. However, that comes with the challenges where uh, to use those tools, the, uh, the biologists and the research and life science, they need to have a skills. And, um, and then if you deal with dealt ever with the bioinformatics software, probably you know that sometimes it's hard to use. And there is a lack of standards at the moment where what, how we define the, the, the usability of the tools. And the question uh, I want to answer is, the, is it possible to make the, the scientific software to be user-friendly? And then, as you can see, there are many people warning that it's either it's oxymoron, so it's not possible, or like what needs to be done. So what we were interested in, can we assess the field? Can we ask the question, how many tools in the field are usable and how many not, and what should we do? Uh, so before I will tell you the results, what we have found, just want to define a couple of things. So um, I think the challenges in the, the main challenges in developing the, the scientific software is the lack of experience of the, the, in academia settings. So the people who develop software, they are not necessarily trained to be uh, the, 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 the software developers. And so as a result, they develop the, the, the software with the idea that the user know as much about software as they do, which is not necessarily true and then probably never true. Um, so then there is a process where the main appreciation in academia setting co comes from the publishing and there is a lot of resources and then the funding uh, for, for new discoveries. However, there is a lack of resources to maintain the tools. And uh, also, as you publish, right, if you ever submit the paper, if you forgot to include the results section in the paper, the paper will be automatically rejected, like the second one. However, if you do software, you can do it in any way possible, and then the, probably it will sneak in. So because there is no formal procedure how anybody will check the usability, and that the whole focus is on the reviewers to have enough expertise to check it. And then the problem is the reviewers don't have time, and then many, in many cases, they don't have enough expertise. So, uh, so definitely needs to be done, and something needs to be done to address those challenges. And then if you compare academia versus industry, that's a, the whole different story. Um, uh, as the academia, again, there is lack of resources, right? So if you don't have the funding, to hire software developers to, tr to train the, the, the researchers in, in, um, in the software techniques, so you will be not able to, 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 uh, to develop the user-friendly software. Um, and so as a result, um, again, coming to the funding, there is lack uh, of uh, continuous support uh, for, for the software development. Uh, so what to address uh, those challenges and then to overview the field so we have uh, uh, we have pre uh, we have did a study where we check the archival stability and usability of the tools so the, the results are on the preprint and then in the editorial we have published um, okay so why it's important why it's important to be able to to use the software so first of all when you develop the software you have the idea that other people in the community will use that and then I think that the computational gen bioinformatics and computational genomics, and then like I think it's keep increasing so we can talk about the health sciences, and then it's quite a unique position where people who develop the tools are, do have the skills and do have this, the advanced computational skills to, 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 to use the tools. However, people who are using them, they are potentially people from the life science or the medical school, which are not formally trained in the computation, so that means they will be not, they don't have enough skills to use the software if it's complicated, right? Uh, 
And overall, not being able to run the software which was published means that you're doing unreproducible science, right? So if the software doesn't run, you will never know if you can reproduce the results. Right, so this is very important conception. So probably you heard about reproducibility as the general concept where people take the papers and they try to reproduce the biological results and they can't. So here we talk about something even more, like we talk here even, uh, we talk about something simpler in the way that we talk about computational reproducibility, right? So it should be no reason not being able to reproduce things computationally. If you share the code, if your software is user friendly, you, you should be able to reproduce the results. Okay, so to assess the current state in the field, so what we did, we took PubMed, uh, public, uh, the publication from PubMed across many journals, which you can see in the table. So in total, we have got uh, more than 50,000 papers in computational biology and structural biology. And then, so what we did, we extracted the links from those papers, from the abstract, but very often what we notice that even though the paper introduced the new software or uses the software, that the link will be in the body. So we also extracted the link in the bodies. So in total, we have got more, 30, more than 36,000 software tools and databases. And we use the keywords, uh, so like available, the tool, computational, all these things, to make sure this is the database of the tool. We were not able to differentiate uh, especially in the body between uh, the, the, the tool being introduced by that paper and the tool being used, because there is no clear structure for that. And then to us, this is to, and then the question we have asked, are those links working, right? The very simple question, are they working? And then we also got 99 randomly selected bioinformatics tools um, uh, of, uh, and then we just randomly selected them to, to check the usability. Okay, so the first part of my talk, I will talk about the archival stability and then we'll transition to usability. Okay, um, so we develop a very simple protocol. We take the link and we check is it broken, is it timeout, or is it working? Uh, and then we have uh, sp uh, split the links by years, right, when the paper was published. And then what we can see that the, the I guess as expected, if you publish in 2005, potentially in like 50% of the cases, your link will be broken. So why is that? Uh, just because in academia, it's the tradition is to, to, to at least it what used to be, so to, to have the links on the personal web pages. So you change the job, probably your, your web page goes down, the link is no longer active, right? So, but you can see that even in the recent years, there is a certain fraction of the tools which are broken, I mean, of the links which are broken. So there is something like systematic happening, and then if you see on the plot uh, on, on, on your uh, left, so you can uh, see that like there is absolute numbers. So even in absolute numbers, there are quite many tools very recent uh, with the links being broken. Uh, so what we see that if there is a sig significantly more amount of social media attention on your link, so probably the link will be maintained. And then we hypothesize that that is just the pressure of people commenting on you, on your link, or like there is some attention on Twitter, so potentially you will keep that working rather than uh, that to die and then be broken. Uh, so also, I think the solution, I mean, here in this community, I think it's obvious that we need to store the links and the software and, the, and then on the GitHub, right, on the specific web pages which are designed uh, to, be, to store the code. Uh, so, and then we are doing quite well in academia, right, so you can see GitHub appeared quite recent, but now it's taken uh, around 15% of the, of the market in academia, right, so 15% of the tools are p ever published are stored uh, on the GitHub, which is great. So you can see the source forge for various reasons didn't get that popularity. So why GitHub is great? So GitHub is stable, right? We, we all know that. Uh, it's not clear will it be stable long term, right? We don't know that. Will it be around forever? But so far as the very practical solution, um, I think it's a good one. So why, so you can see in red, which is uh, uh, devotes for broken link, right? So it has 3%. So 3% of the links stored on GitHub are broken. So I think those 
those links which are broken are just intentionally broken in a way, right? Because I don't see other mechanism how, how that could be. Uh, it's a little bit larger number on the source forge, but it's much better comparable uh, to the uh, conventional, right, a way to store uh, the links on the personal web pages or somewhere else. So I think this is, will be one of our recommendations we, we did in our paper where we say you should store your links on the GitHub, right, to make them archivably stable. Okay, so so we did the, the which was simple, so we did uh, archival stability assessment. So now as we go to the software usability, it's a little bit more tricky. You cannot do that automatically, right? So but there is, again, no common protocols. What is the means installation, right? You might have one single command, which will be fantastic. However, very often you have many different commands, right, uh, for an installation. There is no kind of requirement. I mean, it could be as many. It could be we saw tools with 100 or so commands, which is like insane, because you need that many dependencies. Uh, so what we did, so I'm running the, the genomic group uh, with the undergrads, and then I strongly believe in undergrads being able to do research, especially in the computational genomics. So uh, that was a project driven by the undergrads. So we assigned 10 tools per undergrad to check usability. And what we do, uh, uh, that uh, the, the, the undergrads, they try to install, they try to follow the instructions uh, on the web page. They try to record the total number, the total time they, they spent trying to install the tool, the number of commands they run, actually run, versus the number of commands in the manual, which is often different, and uh, all other things. Um, OK, so this is our protocol to check usability. So we basically try everything we can. If we install the tool, it doesn't work. Maybe we miss the dependency, so we'll try to fix it. Was the test data provided? Often you will be surprised no test, that they, test data is provided, so meaning you cannot verify the usability, right, at all, if you don't have the test data. So you should know, or you should come up with the test data. We also tried that, because there is a common problem in computational genomics, like being read alignment, and that requires the sequencing DNA fragments from the sequencing machine. So we know what's that, so we can provide that, even though it was not provided. So we tried, like, everything uh, we can to, to, to help the tool succeed and being installed. Okay, so what we observe. So first thing, we define the tool which are easy to install, so they are requiring less than 15 minutes, right? So you put your clock, you open the web page, you, you copy-paste the commands into the Unix machine, and uh, you try to install the tool, right? So you can see that 50, more than actually 50% of the tools are requiring less than 15 minutes to be installed. Uh, another 20, more than 20% are complex installations. So what do we mean by the complex? We allow up to two hours for the tool installation, right? So you, what you're allowed to do, what you have seen in the protocol, so you're allowed, you're allowed to fix the dependencies if they were not taken care of, right? Or you can... Um, fixing the code, right? We have those cases where the, the installation script was wrong or some code which was some hard coding in, in the, somewhere in the code, so we have fixed that. So you have two hours to do that. So we were able to, to do that for 21% of the tools. So, and then uh, the, the remaining tools, which is accounting for more than 27%, are not working. So no matter what we did, they're just not working due to severe uh, limitations um, in the implementations of the tool. Uh, so as we take the tool which work, okay? So we ask a question, will they pass automatic installation test? So what, how we define that, we say if you just blindly copy-paste the commands from the manual, will it work? So actually it will in almost 60% of the cases. For the rest, you need some intervention. So you need a human intervention. Something was missing, some command was missing, you would uh, need to, to, to come up with that command by Googling or like finding that, okay? Uh, so why it's important? Why it's important the tools to pass the automatic installation test? Just because it's in manual interventions, they are expensive, right? So you can see the time in minutes here that on average for 
the tools for automatic tools, it took like 10 minutes to install. So that's easy. You just open the menu, you copy paste, and then the only downside might be they're just heavy. They will run for some time. But there is no kind of challenge. So as the tool is not automatically, uh, uh, doesn't pass the automatic installation test, that requires significantly more time. Um, what is the fraction of the undocumented commands, right? So if the tool does not pass uh, the automatic installation, then that means the tool, the manual of the tool, does have the um, undocumented commands. So as you can see, again, the tools which are easy to install that requires less than 15 minutes, they have a tiny fraction of undocumented commands. And then for the rest, for the complex, and then not installed, you have a significant fraction of undocumented commands comparable for, for the original ones. So as you can see, actually, it's interesting that complex will have more than non-installed. So why is that? Because we tried hard. So for the complex, it was some issues, but it was like installable, right, in a way. So we tried multiple, multiple things. For the non-installed, sometimes it was, didn't work from the command one. So it was no chance, right? For the complex, what happened is that we, we let's say we did 50% of the manual, and then um, we got stuck, right? So we tried a couple of more commands. But for not install, very often, I think it's like the first command you run just didn't work. And then you kind of give up because nothing, nothing works. OK. Um, so coming to Bioconda, right, related to this conference, so what we discovered, the package managers are great, right? So I guess it's, it should not be convincing this audience. But we got, out of 99 tools, we got 10 to be available by Bioconda. So what we did, uh, we just used Bioconda to install them, and then they were 100% installable, which is great, because that compares to 68% if it's not uh, um, done using the package manager. Uh, so why you should, from your user, pers uh, from the developer perspective, why you should develop a good software? Because you will have more citations, right? So if you don't do a good job implementing the tool, nobody will be able to use the tool. So as a result, the, the paper you, you have introduced the tool will be not cited. So what we see, the tools which are installed, they have significantly more citations uh, comparable to the tools which are not installed. OK, um, so conclusions. Um, so I think what we want, to, we, which we presented in the paper, is that set of, um, a set of good practices in the academic, in academia, how to increase the archival stability and usability of the tool. So you should uh, host the, the tools and the code on archivably stable services like GitHub. Um, you should provide easy to use installation interface like Bioconda, and you will get more citations. Um, just because Bioconda in our case was 100% installable. Um, and I think we also suggested, which I didn't list it here, so we also suggested to change the, the, the current policy when the, uh, of, the, of the scientific publishing. So some initiative, we think, needs to come from the journals where the usability will be enforced at the publication level, right? When the paper is published, if you actually provide the source code, if you provide all the instructions uh, which uh, are needed to install your tool, and you provide the test data, right? So that is actually sufficient. Uh, in the certain format, which we can uh, come up with, like universal format. So that is actually sufficient uh, to guarantee the usability of the tool, right? So again, and then I think one of the reasons, because in, in, in um, bioinformatics world, we, we operate in, on the Unix based operating system. So, and then if you assume uh, the standard uh, amount of packages and then the, the, the tools being available there, and then you will take care of all the dependencies. So really you can check the usability. So I think more needs to come from the, from the journals and then the publishing um, when, the, when the tool has, tools are publishing. Uh, and so I think uh, as the future work, we're really excited to explore the package managers and containers more and uh, first increase the usability of those in, in the academic settings and then two, uh, do a benchmarking, right? So there is Bioconda, but there is also Singularity. There is easy build, easy lin Linux brew. There is like so many, right? And then there is no benchmark, like which one are better, what are the limitations and what is the advantages of those? 
So, um, so we have heard the talk today that Conda can be slow sometimes, right? So what, is it important? What is the scale of that, right? Is it slow for one package? On average, it's slow one minute. So how does it affect us, right? So what we plan to do, we plan to do benchmark where we will record the installation time across all the Bioconda packages, and we'll report that, and we'll compare across uh, the other, um, other package managers. So we're launching any source of consortium uh, for that, uh, um, and then uh, hoping to, to write a review paper. OK, so that's work of many. That's international effort uh, with people um, across uh, different universities, led by, uh, by, by me and Ryan Blackman from University of Minnesota, and then Elazar Eskin, Jonathan Flynn from UCLA, and many other, Tiago, which is now at Amazon. OK, so if you're interested to reproduce our results, so we have Jupyter Notebooks being available. Uh, on, the, on my GitHub, so this is the link. If you need to take a photo, please do. So it's called Good Software. So we provide all the steps. So if you're interested to reproduce the results or you want to extend on what we did, so please do. If you're interested um, uh, in any of this work, please shoot me email. Uh, this is my contact information. And um, OK, thank you. And then I will be happy to answer the questions.